Hello, and welcome to the interview podcast. Uh, if you're joining back in, thank you for listening again. If this is your first time here, my name is Blake Wright. I am a furniture designer and builder out of Los Angeles, and this is my podcast. Every week, I talk to artists and intellectuals and just people who generally interest me, and uh, this week is no different. Today's guest is Dr. Brian Keating. He's a cosmologist out of UC San Diego. Uh, he has got plenty of credentials to vouch for. He's the director of the Simons Observatory. Um, he also worked on the BICEP and BICEP2 telescopes. I believe he was uh, one of the creators of those telescopes, actually. He's also got a book out called Losing the Nobel Prize. And he does a podcast called Into the Impossible for the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation. Brian and I had a really great conversation today. Uh, he was a little short on time, so I tried to just uh, throw as many questions out there as I could. And luckily enough for me, he is a great communicator, and he had some awesome answers to the questions that I threw out there. So, uh, yeah, it was a great talk, and I hope to have him on again soon. If you are not familiar with uh, Brian Keating's podcast, Into the Impossible, uh, it's also on YouTube. He um, probably gets just as much traffic on YouTube. Seems like he kind of favors the the YouTube videos for these. But yeah, if you're not familiar, you should definitely check it out. He's got, you know, world class uh, theoretical physicists and uh, astronomers and cosmologists and all the like, um, as well as just great minds on the show. Uh, I've been following his podcast for a little while now. And uh, it was just a huge honor for me to have him on this show, especially so young into the show. And uh, I just want to thank him again for coming on. And uh, I really hope that you enjoy our conversation. If you could please leave a like and review on my podcast interview, as well as subscribing on iTunes and Spotify. I also have a YouTube channel, Interview Pod, uh, and I'm on Instagram at Interview Pod. Once again, every Monday, I've got new shows coming out. And if you like what you hear today, then I hope that you will subscribe and um and there will be more coming your way. Thanks again, and enjoy the episode. Let's do it, man. <clears throat> awesome. So am I. All right. Welcome to the interview podcast. My guest today is the professor of physics at the Center for Astrophysics and Space Sciences at UCSD. Uh, he's an author. He's got a book out called Losing the Nobel Prize, and he also does a podcast called Into the Impossible for the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation. Uh, welcome to the show, Brian Keating. How are you, buddy? Um, it, uh, it's great to be with Mr. Wright. You know, I just <laughs> hope my my wife doesn't find out you exist. <laughs> I tell uh, I tell people, you know, my friends that are single women that they shouldn't look for finding the perfect man because my wife got the last one. But oh yeah. <laughs> now I know Mr. Wright, so who knows? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, uh, it's a uh, really a pleasure to have you on the show today. I've been listening to your podcast for a while and watching you on YouTube, and uh, I'm definitely a fan. So uh, I really appreciate you being here with me. I'm glad to be here with you. It's a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, um, for people who aren't aware of you, I'm sure if they're watching this, they probably already are. But uh, could you briefly describe, um, you know, a little bit about your career, maybe um, about the bicep telescopes that you worked on and uh, a little bit about what you're doing nowadays? So, yes, yeah, so it's a pleasure to be here. I am a cosmologist. So I am a, a someone who works on hair, nails, makeup. Uh, no, that's a cosmetologist. <clears throat> but actually, they have the same prefix, which is cosmos, which means beauty. And as you can see behind me, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, I get to work in some pretty beautiful places and I get to look at the beauty of the night sky. And that's where that prefix cosmos comes from. It's a beautiful universe and we have to uncover it. And nature gives us certain abilities to do that. And my team and I build telescopes that can peer back to the very beginning of light, uh, to the beginning of the earliest light in the universe when it set out on its journey over 13.798 billion years, <laughs> traveling through space and time, encountering all sorts of interesting media <clears throat> on its way to our telescope. So behind me is pictured the Atacama Desert of Chile and the site of the Simons Observatory, which I am proud to be the uh, principal investigator of, uh, along with uh, a huge team of the most brilliant, far more brilliant than I am, 
uh, scientists in the world. And so we're looking for the wispy afterglow of the Big Bang, and that's called the cosmic microwave background radiation. Right. And, it, and yeah, go ahead. And you're one of the <clears throat> premier researchers of the CMB, as I'm aware of. Well, yeah, it is my specialty. It's what I've chosen to focus on. And my career has been dedicated to for well, it's coming up on, you know, 30 years almost now. And in addition to the day job as a practicing cosmologist, I also wrote a book, as you said, <clears throat> it's called Losing the Nobel Prize. It's uh, now available in paperback, Kindle and uh, audiobook and hardcover. And it's the story of what it is like to be a young scientist striving to accomplish the greatest feats in his or her field. And in my case, that's to uh, unravel the mysteries of how the universe came to, came to be. And along the way, aspiring to win the most prestigious award that there is in all of society, not just science, and that's mm -hmm. known as the Nobel Prize. Yeah, I, I read your book uh, in pre preparation for this, and uh, it was a pleasure and uh, a really good experience reading that. And it uh, taught me a lot of things that I wouldn't have ever even thought to think of, you know, in the scientific fields, just kind of the politics around everything. Um, it's just something that I think ordinary people don't really think of science as political. And uh, it was interesting to hear your take on that and, uh, you know, get some insight behind these things that are so mysterious to most people. Uh, what, what interested you about the CMB and, uh, you know, how did you get, you, 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 uh, mentioned that you kind of chose to focus on that in your career. What about that interested you so much that you chose to go down that path? Yeah, when I started uh, as a graduate student is when you choose what your focus is going to be or foci for some of us have multiple interests. Uh, but it was always uh, appealed to me. What always appealed to me were the biggest topics that could possibly be encountered, whether it be the origin of matter, uh, the origin of space and time, or perhaps, you know, the existence of a creator or lack thereof. And so I was always fascinated by questions, which, you know, to many and rightfully so are so daunting that most people don't think about them, let alone choose to work in that field. But for me to understand uh, and ha have a sense of satisfaction with a craft, with a profession, really required that I slake my intellectual thirst. And that was to understand the nature of physical reality mm -hmm. as revealed I, through uh, measurements and, and even the underlying mathematics behind it. I can relate in, you know, pondering those large questions. I obviously don't work in that field at all, but they, uh, they definitely keep me up at night just thinking about those. Yeah, I could tell from your guest questions. list. You, <laughs> you, you talk to guests, you know, you, you come to me as this humble, uh, humble podcaster with a, with a request in a totally different field that I've ever encountered a podcaster. But really? then I listen to your listen to your past guest list. And I see that you have an insatiable curiosity Absolutely. that extends beyond your field. And actually, that for me is the hallmark. So I'm often asked, well, what's it like to be a graduate student? And, you know, is it just nonstop work? There are all these jokes about, you know, I, I, even I make them that, you know, graduate students work eight days a week, et cetera. Uh, and it is extremely grueling to go through. And it's sort of this rite of passage that's been unchanged in almost a thousand years since the first PhDs were sort of granted in Bologna, Italy in the 18, in the uh, first millennium at the end of the first millennium. <clears throat> but, um, you know, in our field, you have to have passion. You must have curiosity. Otherwise you're not going to make it through. It's like, you cannot last five, six, seven years as a student pursuing something, uh, if it's just like you're phoning it in. I mean, first of all, you're not making that much money. You do get paid to be a graduate student in physics in most places if you're getting a PhD, but it's not much. It's you know mi below minimum wage uh, <laughs> considering how many hours you work. So if you right. don't have passion, if you don't have drive, if you don't have initiative that I always say, only become a graduate student and study whatever field you, you're in, um, science or not, only become a graduate student if you can't see not becoming a graduate student. Otherwise, it's not going to be for you. I can relate to that, you know, pursuing a career in an artistic field where, you know, I'm making furniture, I'm doing woodworking and metalworking, and um, I'm not 
making money. I'm spending a lot more than I'm making on materials and workshop and everything. Sounds like my podcast. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's, I'm in it more for the gratification of the making and, you know, the process and the artistic creation and the learning is really the main thing that drives me has always just been gaining more knowledge, uh, which I'm sure yeah. you relate to. Yeah, it's absolutely correct. And, and in fact, you know, sometimes people come to me and they want to be a graduate student. And I say, did you ever work on your car? You know, did you ever, you know, tweak her? And now it's harder to do that, you know, if their car is a, you know, a modern a Tesla. You know, te Tesla or something <laughs> like that. And in fact, uh, I think, yeah, I think I don't want them if, if they're working on, you know, their Tesla. <laughs> but instead, you know, I think about it as uh, kind of things. I, I used to have a 1979, uh, you know, Volkswagen Rabbit that actually had, uh, you know, probably cost far less than my podcast equipment costs today. <laughs> <laughs> but I had an insatiable desire because I had no, I had uh, a satiable wallet. You know, I had very mm -hmm. little money. I was working my way through high school and college, and uh, I wanted to fix the brakes. I wanted to put in a, you know, a kick-ass stereo system. I couldn't do it. I couldn't <laughs> take it to a store to do it. So I had to do it myself. And, uh, but that really, um, taught me what the value of, of manual labor is. And, and that came in extremely valuable. Um, you know, oftentimes at the site pictured behind me, we're at almost 17,000 feet above sea level and you have a problem with the diesel generator. Well, what is a diesel generator? It's the same as an engine in a car. Yeah. And, and you have to tweak it and fix it and understand, well, why is it not firing up? Why does it need, you know, what kind of property? Well, I had that same problem in 19, you know, 88 uh, with my rabbit and now I can, you know, tweak it. Yeah, so you, you talked about yeah, your book the, about working yeah. at the South Pole and just the remoteness of that location. I'm sure it's the same in Chile there, but uh, I'm sure you've got to get pretty ingenuitive when you're <laughs> working so remotely. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the South Pole. Let's see if I can find a picture to replace my virtual background right now. <laughs> uh, but I'll show you a picture of the South Pole. It is indeed a very uh, a place unlike any other place on Earth. So right behind me yeah. is my experiment there. There's bicep uh, on the right above my shoulder there, and there's another telescope on the far left called the South Pole Telescope. But behind me, you see almost nothing. It's basically flat barren white you know frozen frigid plateau there's nothing there here's the here's the building that we live in this is where our dorms are and each one i can touch both sides of the wall simultaneously <laughs> it, it's not a place you go for you know a great deal of wide open spaces but there are beautiful things there here's a picture of friends launching a, a stratospheric balloon near an active volcano uh, called mount erebus at the uh, antarctic station and here's how we get there on a military cargo plane paid for by your tax dollars uh, in the U.S. Air Force. So uh, it's an amazing place to be. It's incredibly remote. It's dangerous. It has uh, very forbidding aspects to it. But, you know, the payoff of doing the science really makes it all worth it. Yeah, there's something beautiful about that, too. You're so out there and you're you're peering into deep space and it almost seems like you're not on Earth. And there's there's something beautiful there. Absolutely. Yeah. We actually have at the South Pole, you'll be interested to know, there's carpenters, there's plumbers, there's electricians. You can't make all this stuff behind me. Look at this, this building behind me, right next to my ear on the left side of the screen. That, that's a huge, gigantic wooden building. Mm -hmm. And that's a dorm where we stay while we wait for our plane and the weather to improve to get us to the South Pole. And you meet all sorts of people here. It's like a mining town, right? And you wouldn't think of it as primarily dedicated to science, but that's why it's there. And that's why we go there. It's one of the best places on earth to do the science we need to do. Why is it that that's the best place there? So um, I don't know where, where you are currently. Where, where are you located? I'm down in LA. Oh, you're in LA. Okay. I was going to say, um, you know, uh, I come from the Northeast and sometimes in the Northeast you'll find uh, on the weather report, which you never got growing up in LA, <clears throat> but they would say things on the East coast. It was a snow day. Uh, and then some days it would be even worse. They'd say it's not a snow day. And you'd be like, oh man, why isn't it a snow day? And uh, the reason was it was too cold to snow. <laughs> so the, there was so much, uh, uh, so little moisture in the atmosphere. It had all, here we are at this picture behind me. We're at 17,200 feet above sea level. The temperature is negative 30 degrees. Wow. It's plenty cold enough for ice and snow to form. But the, uh, any moisture in the air comes out of the air, leaving the sky mostly pristine, blue, and, and free of clouds. Uh, and the South Pole is even more uh, likely to be like that. We, here's a here's a shot of Mount uh, uh, Mount Palomar, 
<clears throat> here in San Diego, what we're looking for are, are these pristine blue skies. And actually, you get a much higher chance of that in a cold climate at high altitude. That's why telescopes are built up on top of mountains. Mm -hmm. It's a little known fact, the South Pole is built up on a mountain, not really a mountain, a, a plateau of ice. It's totally flat. There's no, there's no terrain. There's no features at the South Pole. So I'm sure here it is now. If you can look off in the distance 800 kilometers before you hit a mountain or see, a, see an, another living creature. Uh, but the sky is just this pristine dark blue of space. And it's as close as you can get to space. We call it kind of the poor scientist satellite. <laughs> yeah, 14,000 feet. That's pretty impressive. It's, uh, for, for yeah, the, the flat plane. Yeah, the South Pole is about 9,500 feet, and okay. then Chile is at 17,000 feet. Mm, wow. Um, so I know you're pretty short on time today. Let's get into some technical uh, speak here. Can you explain to us what the CMB is and why it's so important to you? Yeah, the CMB. To your research is uh, the oldest fossil light in the universe. It's a type of light that comes in all directions. It comes at all times of year and all locations on earth. And it's basically the uh, wallpaper of the universe. It's light that's been traveling since the uh, formation of the first atoms, since the formation of hydrogen atoms. <clears throat> and since that time, 13.8 billion years ago, these uh, particles of light called photons by Albert Einstein have been streaming towards our telescopes on Earth and throughout the universe, in fact, uh, for those many millennia. And by the time they reach our telescopes, they have uh, the imprints upon them of every physical entity, every quantity that they have encountered along the way from the telescope to our, our uh, from, the, from the origin of, of hydrogen to our telescopes. So we're really in this tradition of the great Galileo Galilei. I'm showing him his uh, first telescopes that he used in his museum in, in Florence, Italy, uh, dedicated to Galileo. And what we're trying to do is, is unravel the nature of all the effects, all, all the physical properties, everything that's happened in the universe since the formation of the first atoms. And that's what we're trying to do. That's a noble pursuit. That's um, a Nobel a pursuit. Of, a lot of, yeah, a lot of information there to uh, try and solve from some photons. Yeah, the, what's interesting about nature is that it gives you precious little information, even if you're on Earth. Uh, but at least if you're on Earth, you could do an experiment. You probably took in high school or college or whatever, biology class, you take a worm, you cut it open, you, you do something to the worm, or you give it some, you do an experiment on it, and you compare it to another worm uh, that you didn't do these dastardly deeds to. And then you see what are the effects of the uh, of what you did on the worm compared to the control worm that you didn't touch, and that process is is a process of you know multiple testing, multiple specimens, etc. How do you do that when you have only one universe to study? Mm, it's very yeah. hard. And how do you control. do it when you? Yeah, I can't go out and change the temperature of the sun by 10% and then ask, well, what happens to the production of uh, this element, uh, you know, or this, this molecule called phosphine that was discovered on Venus? What would it look like if the sun were 10% hotter? Oh, let me just do that experiment. No, you can't <laughs> do it. So all we have to do, all we have to work with are particles of light and particles of matter that come from the universe itself. And we just have to be patient, but encoded within those particles is a vast amount of information, but you have to be clever. You have to have a, a good uh, team. You have to have good technology and you most of all have to be patient. These things have been traveling 14 billion years. Yeah. Uh, you better spend your time with them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I saw on your last slide there. And also uh, it was a major theme in your book, the B mode signals that you're searching for. Um, what exactly are these B mode signals? So if uh, whenever matter uh, is, uh, is impacted by light, so here's an image <clears throat> of sunlight on the left uh, coming from the sun, bouncing off the ocean here in Los Angeles, San Diego, whatever, and then being reflected to an observer wearing glasses. In this case, they're polarized sunglasses. Whenever light interacts with matter, as I'm showing here, uh, let me just cover up my face. You don't need to see me. But uh, whenever light interacts with matter, it induces the possibility for it to become polarized, which means that the light will have a preferential axis at which it is uh, oscillating about. And that's called the polarization direction. Most people are familiar with two properties of light, its color and how bright it is. But there's a third property called polarization, which says which direction the electrons in the 
electromagnetic field would be oscillating if the light hit it. And most light is unpolarized from sources like the sun and stars, but when it interacts with matter, in this case, water, it has a propensity to become polarized. Hmm. So you can use that to either the, uh, the net polarization that you observe in your polarized sunglasses here, you can use that to either learn about the source of light, namely the sun, or learn about the properties of the matter that it interacted with, namely the ocean. And as long as the matter has some, um, uh, some symmetries that are broken within it, and namely it has waves or it has patterns, it has change in density or salinity or whatever, you will get a different type of polarization signal depending on the properties of the matter. In our case with these B modes, <clears throat> what we're studying is not the matter itself. We know that there was matter in the early universe. I said there was hydrogen. And right before hydrogen formed, uh, the universe also had a great deal of photons. But in addition to the matter, it had space and time. And what Einstein predicted in 1915 was that space-time itself could be, uh, could be perturbed. It could have tiny uh, variations from point to point in space, namely that you would weigh a little bit more. Your body would weigh physically more in one location, either depending on the proximity to a source of gravitational waves or depending on how long you wait after a certain event called uh called the big bang in this case so what we're we're looking for is this interaction of matter and light caused by these ripples of space and time called gravitational waves and they would produce we were told we were hoping uh <laughs> literally they would produce this pattern called b mode polarization that i'm showing here and in fact we claim that we did see it using the bicep 2 telescope uh located here in the center of this image and i'm showing here the bicep 2 telescope at the South Pole, which I had designed with my colleagues at Caltech to detect exactly the signal uh, as we hoped that we would be able to reveal the earliest, uh, the earliest traces of matter and energy in the universe's history. Wow, that's, uh, that's quite an explanation there. <clears throat> um, so if I'm understanding this correctly, the B mode signals are um, basically the polar polarization of the photons that have interacted with the matter on the way to the telescope? Yeah, so anything can cause polarization as long as there's light <clears throat> and as long as there's matter, you can have the, prop, uh, the, the, the possibility of polarization occurring. Uh, but that same pattern that I'm showing here, which we knew would lead to Nobel gold had we detected it, can also be produced by other effects besides gravitational waves, hmm. that these B modes can come from sources that are basically nuisance effects that we don't want to see. In the case of what ended up being the culprit in the Bicep 2 episode, uh, there were these tiny grains of dust produced in the same cataclysmic uh, nuclear explosions called supernovae that most likely formed the uh, heavy elements in our body, namely the calcium, silicon, uh, nitrogen, and even the iron in the hemoglobin molecule that flows through our veins. So there's iron in there, and that comes from a supernova that exploded perhaps five, six billion years ago in our galaxy and, uh, and, and created the material in which the sun and the planets were formed in our solar system, but also polluted the interstellar medium between the stars in our galaxy with dust. And that dust can get aligned with the Milky Way as a magnetic field, just like the Earth has a magnetic field. Mm. And that Milky Way's alignment can produce a pattern of microwaves that will have the same kind of swirling, twisting patterns that we claimed and we did detect. So in fact, what we saw and we later realized was not the imprint of inflation, the, the af immediate aftermath of the, of the origin of space time itself, but rather these tiny little grains of dust spinning in magnetic fields that thread their way throughout the Milky Way galaxy. Hmm. While you're on the subject of supernovae, I'd like to talk uh, about black holes a little bit. Sure. Um, I read this morning in Quantum Magazine uh, a very interesting article, and I'd like to read you a little quote from that article and see what your thoughts are on it. Yeah. <clears throat> it says, let's see here. In some way or another, 
space-time itself seems to fall apart at a black hole, implying that space-time is not the root level of reality, but an emergent structure from something deeper. Although Einstein conceived of gravity as a geometry of space-time, his theory also entails the disillusion of space-time, which is ultimately why information can escape its gravitational prison. Um, so the article was about how they're theorizing that information can escape a black hole. Um, is this something that you've given thought to? Is it something that you are working on? What is your take on this? It's not something I've either, you know, uh, worked on or given thought to. I will say that um, my friend, uh, Sir Roger Penrose, just won the Nobel Prize uh, and will receive it in a couple of weeks. He's been on my podcast multiple times and he's going to come back, he said, awesome. uh, which is great. And he's worked on uh, exactly this topic of black holes and their properties, really revealing the strange and beautiful structures that they sort of possess. Uh, one of the things that he worked on with his very close friend and colleague, Stephen Hawking, was the notion that black holes are sort of these cosmic vacuum cleaners that uh, have a peculiar property that you, when you put matter inside of them, they, uh, they grow in a certain way and that their area increases, their surface area increases by some amount, and that depends on the material that you throw in. So the more uh, bits of information, the more molecules that you throw in, uh, you can increase the size of it. And uh, in a sense, the information that you throw in is fungible in that if I throw in my PhD thesis or losing the Nobel Prize, it could be the same as just throwing in a lump of paper or the same amount. And all that comes out is the black hole gets a little bit bigger. Now the question of how black holes eventually evaporate and can radiate via a process called a Hawking radiation, that is uh, a predicted effect by Stephen Hawking to occur over, you know, literally billions, if not trillions of years for some black holes. And these black holes then would radiate the information out uh, and they would disappear. And in that sense, you there's a question about how the entropy or the information properties of the black hole might get uh, taken away. In other words, you might decrease the entropy of the system when considering the, uh, the, the, the system of the black hole before and after within the universe. So it's not something I work on, although uh, Sir Roger Penrose has a theory that some of the data that I'm showing here, the swirling, twisting pattern of microwaves known as B-modes mm -hmm. from the BICEP2 experiment, he claims that they are actually remnants of black holes in a preceding eon he calls it oh yes i yeah. heard him discuss this i believe last time he was on your show actually yeah that's right so that's called hawking points and he believes they come from black holes that s survive the transition from one eon a e o n in his nomenclature to the <laughs> next and so he's agreed now he's gotten a lot of publicity from winning the nobel prize obviously right uh, although he endorsed my book entitled losing the nobel prize and called it a wonderful <laughs> book so i pointed that out to him uh, so hopefully he'll come on my show and i can ask him that very question that you're posing about this notion of of information and the so-called information paradox of black holes i'll also have on uh lenny suskind who wrote a book called Black Hole Wars, My Battle with Stephen Hawking <laughs> over black holes. So he's going to come on in a couple of weeks. Get some well. differing opinions there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, the, the line that sticks out to me most from that article is um, that they're saying that maybe space-time is not the root level of reality, but there could be some kind of you know, source code behind space-time. Uh, is that something that you would agree with? Do you think it's maybe possible some kind of... No, I, no? I don't subscribe to that kind of... That's a little more far out from my It's pretty opinion. deep. <laughs> yeah, I always find it funny that people talk about the source code or the simulation hypothesis. I'm hoping to have Nick Ballstrom on mm -hmm. the podcast. He wrote uh, a, a wonderful book about uh, effectively the simulation hypothesis that we're actually running in a computer simulation. Mm -hmm. But I always point out anything with a source code or simulation implies a simulator, right. which implies some teleological purpose perhaps, which is tantamount in my mind to maybe a creator mm -hmm. uh, if you're so inclined or if even if you're not most most scientists most cosmologists 90 percent probably are atheists like devout atheists mm -hmm. but yet they entertain things like the simulation hypothesis yeah. not all but some do and uh mm -hmm. yeah, i always find it a little bit ironic that and they um they'll promote things that have encrypted within them uh you know a three-year-old uh ethical 
uh, morality um, mm-hmm. with, with perhaps monotheism encoded, uh, but they don't ever study the 3000 year old ethical monotheistic <laughs> tradition of the Western hemisphere. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in this particular article, they weren't necessarily uh, hinting it at um, anything like that. I think no. what they were mostly talking about was string theory. Um, they were mm. wondering if, you know, things can escape a black hole through strings. And uh, they were also talking about uh, entanglement between the, the outer surface and the inner side of the black hole. Yeah. Yeah. Those are, those are topics that, you know, certainly I think about and um, I'm curious about. I did a series of episodes this summer uh, with people ranging from Stephen Wolfram uh, to Eric Weinstein. There's Mathematica logo (laughs) behind me here. And uh, we did a a bunch of of episodes concerning those uh, new theories that Eric Weinstein and, and Stephen Wolfram have in particular other people, Garrett Lisi, uh, and there's a proliferation of these theories, including, you know, theories of everything based on uh, effective field theory, as it's called, and, and more standard things related to quantum gravity via mm. string theory and supersymmetry. I've had on Jim Gates, uh, yeah. who Professor Jim Gates, uh, who's very involved in this. So I always, um, you know, I'm curious about these things, but I always uh, get a little concerned when people get a little too woo-woo about, you know, perhaps there being, you you know, this uh, cosmic, uh, what, uh, well, I won't say who, but one of my friends has, you know, this cosmic, uh, like, I don't know, macrame or, or some kind of weird, uh, weird patterns, uh, Mandela's and, and, and things like that, that I don't uh, have much uh, confidence in the reality thereof. I could see how it's easy to go there if you're too uh, too consumed by the subject. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's so mysterious. A, it is mysterious. Look at this. I mean, the mystery of the night sky to me is enough in mind to understand uh, when you're looking for you know these these relic remnants of fossils traveling through time for 14 billion years. It's like uh, you don't need to add on anything to that. It's like when people say, "I want to make." Um, I'll say like uh, holding hands with my wife. Uh, I want to make that more exciting. Like uh, let's put on uh, special gloves. And no, no, it doesn't need that. Like it's <laughs> it, it's already pretty damn good the way that uh, nature, God, if you will, uh, planned it. Mm-hmm. Um, what are your thoughts on universal limits? Um, things like you know the speed of light and absolute zero. Uh, why do you think they exist? Yeah, I've heard you talk about things like the Planck length and, mm-hmm. and um, expansion of the universe and things like that. Is it um, also, do you think it's just something that we're kind of making or do you think they really do exist? Oh, definitely. Yeah, there are things that that are clearly made up by the human mind. I, I forget who it was. It might have been Pauli, Wolfgang Pauli, who sort of had this mystical side to him. I did a podcast with Paul Halpern about Pauli's friendship with Carl Jung and others. Um, and Pauli was an amazing physicist, came up with the Pauli exclusion principle, the concept of the neutrino. And, and yet he believed in, you know, kind of um, different kinds of, uh, of psychological theory that we, you know, dream interpretation and stuff that we believe is total hocus pocus. <laughs> um, but uh, another physicist, you know, looked at uh, one particular constant called the fine structure constant, and that governs the strength of electromagnetism. And it's comprised merely of the electric charge constant in Coulomb's, uh, Planck's constant, and the speed of light. And by a cert- suitable arrangement, you can get a dimensionless constant. In other words, it's a number hmm. of taking just those things and putting them in a certain pattern. And that number, when divided into one, has the value 137 exactly or so they thought back in the 30s or so and so somebody's so a lot of really earnest physicists were looking for you know kind of numerological reasons what is 137 a prime number it's composed of these perfect squares and blah 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 and then it turns out that's nah, not 137 it's 137.05279 blah, 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 you know whatever right. it has no round uh, natural number significance whatsoever and so but you don't hear those people say, oh, I was wrong. It's just like, oh, well, yeah. maybe we have to add on pi, the <laughs> square root to the ninth, negative ninth power, you know. So I find those things more a pattern of confirmation bias. Like Richard yeah. Feynman, who is at Caltech not far from you, uh, way back in the 60s, he's, he came into lecture one day. He said, you're not going to believe what I saw. I saw a license plate and it had the following uh, it had the following license plate tag number. It had 
N6TQR5. Oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> you know what the probability is of finding that? Light? And everyone's like, what the heck? Does and it's like just totally random. But people will see a pattern and want to mm -hmm. attribute something to it. And I think that's the numerological kind of conceit that the human mind seeks thanks to its desire for confirmation and that confirmation bias that can result. Yeah, and that confirmation bias is um, obviously it's always an issue in science, but uh, particularly we're talking about theories of everything. Um, it seems like that is something that plagues people when they're searching for theories of everything is, you know, c connecting these dots that aren't necessarily supposed to connect. Yeah, that's right. Well, you try to force something that wasn't there. But, you know, as I point out in my book, the greatest scientist in history, uh, ranging from Albert Einstein more recently to my hero, Galileo Galilei, back in the, you know, in the 17th century, they were looking to prove effects. You know, I, I, I mentioned to people, there's a famous book by Galileo called The Dialogue. Have you ever heard of it? Mm-mm. Yeah, so it's this uh, second to last book. It's called The Dialogue on Two World Systems, where Galileo was outlining his arguments for Copernicanism, the theory that the Earth is not the center of the universe, but the sun is. And his claim was Copernicus's claim that the Earth orbits around the sun. Well, uh, Galileo wanted nothing more than to prove this to be the case. It's actually what led him to be imprisoned, house in prison. Right. He was never tortured or anything, as I talk about, but he, he was in prison. And uh, here's the prison that he was in, by the way. This is pretty brutal. <laughs> Our, I, I don't know if your audience has young people. Please turn away from the screen. This is the horrible prison that Galileo was forced to be in. Let me cover up my face. There I am there. So this is this beautiful villa. It's called Villa Galolio in, outside of Florence on a hill that overlooks the Duomo in Italy. It's unbelievable. It's paradise. <laughs> I had a conference there. The worst thing that happened to me is I hit my head on the doorway because the doorway is only five foot five inches tall, and I'm a little taller than that. Um, so, you know, this, this notion that Galileo was tortured, imprisoned, et cetera, is really uh, uh, a fantasy and it's kind of a malicious rumor, but in reality, here's one of the views from his palace <laughs> it's, it's, and it was near his daughter who is a nun at a convent not far from there. Anyway, less in prison, more confined. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's, uh, and he even wrote more books after he was in prison. So I was like, I always say, you know, Bernie Madoff would kill to have a prison cell that nice. <laughs> Uh, literally. So getting back to Galileo, he felt that the best, uh, the best proof that the earth was going around the sun uh, was the behavior of the earth's tides. You know, here in, in San Diego, LA, we notice there are four tides a day, two high tides, two low tides. And Galileo mm -hmm. said that, yes, that's right. That proves Copernicus was right because that happens after going through significant discussion because the earth is rotating on its axis and it's revolving around the sun. So it's moving these two compound rotations and here's my Irish coffee down there and you see how the Irish coffee gets shaken up, right? Well, that is the reason we have tides on earth according to Galileo, proving the earth rotates and it revolves. There's one problem, that's totally wrong. The earth's tides are not caused by either any of the aspects of what Galileo's uh, attributed to. In fact, it's caused by the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's so interesting is that book, The Dialogue, uh, which has a beautiful title, The Dialogue on the Two Systems of the Universe, effectively. The original title that Galileo wanted was On the Flux and Reflux of the Earth's Tides in Rivers and Ferns. What the hell's a fern? <laughs> but anyway, um, <laughs> uh, I had to look that up. But the point is, uh, he was driven through confirmation bias, perhaps to even ruin the brilliant ideas of his own book. And in fact, it was the Pope who effectively caused him to change the title to the dialogue, which is a much more striking title in the annals of scientific history. <laughs> That's crazy. I mean, that, <laughs> that must have been quite a trip for you. You know, visiting, I, I know that you visited Galileo's home and you saw obviously his prison there that you were talking about. Um, what did you gain from that trip? Do you think you gained any kind of insight into who he was? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an amazing place. I, I hope uh, everyone can get to visit there soon. I hope COVID uh, dissipates soon. Um, you know, just being there in the presence of this great man, you know, and, and seeing there's the front door to the house um, and just being in this august environment uh, is impossible not to feel his spirit and to see these trees on the path to his house. And some of them are, you know, he was picking the olives from. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing experience to have that. You can't often do that, uh, you know, go to some place where you know, Jesus was and, and uh, you know, you can, but, but the, the point is that those are magical, special places. 
uh, that are more or less intact for, for literally centuries. And for someone like me who worshiped Galileo as a kid and still does, to be honest with you, uh, because he's such an example of a, of a deep person uh, with brilliant ideas and, and horrible fallacies and, and failings and biases and prejudices. And guess what? You know, let the, as Jesus said, you know, let he without sin cast the first stone. And uh, if, uh, before you complain about the, uh, uh, about the uh, moat of dust in your neighbor's eye, take out the plank of wood in your own eye. <laughs> so uh, a, a lot of, a lot of uh, quotes from Jesus from this uh, Jewish scientist over here. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. He was a Jewish carpenter. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's get back into the science of things. Um, so when you're looking at the CMB, are you able to find hints of what lies beyond the CMB? And do you think there is anything else beyond the CMB? Mm. Yeah, there certainly has to be something beyond the CMB. For the CMB is only formed once the universe cooled sufficiently after some process, we don't know mm. exactly what, but it cooled below a certain temperature. Uh, and that temperature was, uh, was small enough that hydrogen could form. So there was certainly something that existed before hydrogen formed. And that was the protons, neutrons, crouton, no, uh, protons, neutrons, electrons, and light that make up uh, the cosmic microwave background, hydrogen, and the subsequent generations of stars, planets, people, podcasters uh, uh, that came afterwards. So the question is, can we use technology to get behind it, uh, beyond it? And the answer is yes, uh, if uh, there was a source of information other than light. For technical reasons, we can't see through the CMB using light because it is the first light in a sense. Uh, but there doesn't mean there aren't other things beyond it, like neutrinos or gravitational waves. Mm. And in fact, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to see if there are gravitational waves, which can go through matter the same way that a gravitational wave can go through the whole earth or the moon's gravity goes through both sides of the earth at the same time, producing a high tide on one side of the earth and a high tide exactly on the opposite side of the earth at the same time. So gravity goes through matter and it can go through the CMB as well. And it can imprint the CMB with a particular type of pattern that we call this B-mode polarization. But that's only if gravitational waves exist at, uh, prior to the formation of the CMB. We know they exist today because we detect them, or our, my colleagues detect them using LIGO and other gravitational wave instruments. Uh, so we know they're real. We know that they exist after the CMB was formed, but do they exist beforehand? Mm. That's the, you know, that's the uh, yeah. 1 million or whatever, 3 million kroner uh, question that for whoever is successful, if it exists, will certainly not lose this prize as spoiler alert, I myself did. Yeah, and that goes back to... Uh... Penrose's theory about this kind of cyclical universe and maybe gravitational waves or black hole, whatever, being able to traverse through from one aeon to the next. Yeah, that's right. We don't know uh, what the nature of the universe would be like if the universe is not suffused with, with the sort of picture that we talked about, namely that there was a big bang and the, and the force or the field that ignited the big bang, we call the inflaton or the inflation field. Uh, but inflation's not necessarily guaranteed to be right. If it were, I wouldn't be doing research. I would be doing reading. And uh, a, lot of a lot of work goes into trying to unravel the nature of inflation, but we're not 100% sure that it even took place. So mm. what we like to do in science is not try to prove things. We try to disprove alternatives. And that's sort of what Galileo did in the dialogue. He disproved the, the Ptolemaic or Aristotelian theory of uh, geocentrism. And he didn't prove that heliocentrism was correct. He couldn't do that back then. We now know it's correct. Uh, but sometimes this confirmation may not be possible in our own lifetime as it wasn't for Galileo. Right, right. Uh, what can you tell us about the cold spot in the CMB? Yeah, so it's behind me in this picture down yeah, here. Yeah, I see it highlighted yeah, there. <laughs> on the right side of the screen. Uh, so a good friend of mine uh, named Jana Levin and another good friend of mine, Glenn Starkman and David Spurgle have worked on problems <clears throat> revolving around the anisotropy or the, the broken symmetry between the CMB and uh, as a function of where you look on the sky. This is exaggerated, 
but there seems to be some anisotropy other than the ordinary fluctuations and different from the gal galaxy that's shown here that bright orange is the a Milky Way galaxy. It produces copious amounts of microwaves, thanks in large part to the dust that befuddled our experiment. <laughs> we did our experiment low down on this image, away from the plane of the galaxy, thinking that as in decades past, there wouldn't be a problem. But in the cold spot region, uh, there actually is a preponderance, an excess of, of colder photons compared to hotter photons. And uh, it seems to be that there is some alignment or some imp very improbable alignment between these. And so my friends, Jan Levin and Glenn Starkman, both of whom I've had on the podcast, they uh, speak about the improbability of it and maybe some mechanisms to resolve it. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think one of the most promising ways to get further information is we only know it's a cold spot thanks to measurements of the microwave background's temperature. Uh, but what we'd like to do is kind of verify that it's real, that it's not a foreground, that it's not some kind of artifact in the processing right. uh, via using its polarization. And to do that, you really need a very good polarimeter working in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. So BICEP, the Simons Observatory, they operate in the Southern Hemisphere. But I do have colleagues that are building an experiment in, in China called the uh, Ali CPT experiment. And they hope to have great statistical constraining power in the Northern Hemisphere. And then the hope is we compare data sets and see if there is this effect. Mm. Uh, but it's something we're going to target with the Simons Observatory. Absolutely. Awesome. How, how large is that spot in relation to, you know, actual length? Oh, it's millions of uh, megaparsecs long. It's one of the biggest mm. structures, you know, if it is indeed a structure, um, you know, a magnetic a monopole, void, really. a void. Yeah. Uh, if it's, if it's, uh, you know, it's comparable, it's much, much larger than any galaxy cluster that we've ever seen. So mm. those can be tens to, you know, a hundred megaparsecs across, meaning a hundred, uh, 300, roughly million light years across. Mm. Uh, but that's pretty small compared to the size of the universe, which is now 90 billion uh, light years across, but still, it's uh, it's not it's not a drop in the bucket. It's something to be investigated because it does stand out like a cold sore thumb. When you say the universe is ninety billion light years across, do you mean that we've observed is the universe not infinite? So, from any perspective within the universe, uh, any direction we look, we can see back to the beginning of time or light itself when that light set off three hundred eighty thousand years after the formation of the elements period of time we call the Big Bang. Uh, when you look, when you take that, that's 14 billion years uh, for simplicity, call it, call it uh, 15 billion years uh, mm -hmm. for the, just making the math easier. <laughs> uh, uh, it turns out that the universe, so that's how far away something would be uh, if the universe were basically static. In other words, if the universe had a diameter at its birth, which was 14 billion uh, light years, 15 billion light years. But because everything in the universe has been expanding, uh, by, and if you integrate the amount of expansion that's occurred since the CMB was formed, you get a factor of three in every dimension. In other words, the actual radius of uh, how far we can see is not the light travel time times the speed of light. It's the light travel time times the speed of light times the amount that the universe has expanded since this image was taken. Mm. And going through the math, it turns out that the radius, the farthest we can see out from our vantage point in the universe is about, uh, is about 45 billion light years. So it's three times the naive estimate. And then we can see out that far, say, looking in the north direction. If we look down in the south direction, we can see something that's 45 billion light years away. That means the two places that we're looking at have a diameter of 90 billion light years. Wow. That's a... Uh... That's awesome. That's so cool to hear you explain that. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's the mind bending mystery. So yes. Oh, yeah, so Blake, we're gonna have to do another uh, yeah. part sometime. I've got a couple of kids that are aching to get out of the house on this Absolutely. beautiful, beautiful day. But I, uh, I certainly had a great time on the show. And I uh, can't wait till it comes out. Yeah, it was a pleasure talking to you. I've been looking forward to this uh, for a while now. And uh, yeah. I'll look forward to your, your next uh, episode with Roger Penrose as well. Yeah, that's coming soon. And uh, if people want to find me, they can tune into the Into the Impossible podcast. I get all sorts of guests like here is my friend Peter Diamandis, episode 45. And uh, I also have a, uh, so that's, you can find on iTunes or wherever you get when you're not listening to Blake's interview uh, <laughs> podcast, listen to that and also my book, um, 
Losing the Nobel Prize, A Story of Cosmology, uh, uh, Ambition and Science's High, Perils of Science's Highest Honors. And uh, find me on YouTube at Dr. Brian Keating and same address on Twitter. Absolutely. I can vouch for it. It's a good read and a great YouTube channel. Thank you so much, Blake. I hope you have a great weekend. You too. Thanks again. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye.